go with the uh, school building project presentation first. After the presentation, the three of the walls will take our seats at the stage so that we can have microphones to be heard and the recording. Um, so, so I'm going to do a quick introduction. My name is Mark Green. I'm on the school committee and chair of the school building committee. Uh, and Dr. Goff is here, Brian Jarvis, and Chris Blessing from Cafe Architects is here as well. Uh, I don't want to speak out in length. I just want to give you one quick little anecdote that, that I, I hopefully I, I think it bodes well. The, the day that this project got officially approved by the uh, MSBA, the Mass School Building, the day that this project first got approved by the MSBA, they had a uh, chart up, a slide up that had all, I think it was eight schools uh, that were up for approval that day. And they were speaking about the cost per square foot. In, uh, in this building, again, it's not a huge sample size, but this building was on the lower end of the spectrum. And importantly, I, they, I don't know how significant it is, but three of the four on the lower end of the spectrum uh, are managed by companies. Now, hopefully, hopefully that's significant, but you know, it's it's certainly comforting. Um, that's just an anecdote that I wanted to share with you. So with that, I'll hand it off to Dr. Goff. Okay. I have my own mic, Mr. Green, so I think I'm good. So let's pick up. Um, just before we get started, I just want to know, did anybody here have children who went through Bird Middle School? I like to always ask. Okay, so you've seen some of Bird Middle School. How about Johnson? Anybody go through Johnson? Okay. Anybody a former student of either Bird or Johnson? Okay, all right. So I don't see that it's that different. Um, but first, no, I wanted to start and just um, recognize the, the Walpole uh, School Building Committee um, because the, their work is, is really um, unbelievable of, of all the meetings we have and, and the work that they've had to put in um, throughout these years. And um, you can see that there's really good representation um, from the, the public schools um, to our, our town uh, representatives, from even Sue from our, our finance committee, um, our select board, and then also um, our community representation, and then Compass Tape, and then David Stevens from New Vista. Um, he was the, the gentleman that really put together all of our visioning sessions um, for the, the staff and for the, um, the community. So just taking a look at um, how we got here. Um, Walpole Public Schools contracted with the uh, McGuire Group to provide this comprehensive master planning study to address the needs of the facility. And um, the report also identified Johnson as having um, major deficiencies as well. And then in 2016, um, there was a secondary school space study option that was conducted by DRA. And then in um, 2016, you'll notice that um, we applied to MSBA with our first statement of interest. And then it wasn't until it was until 2018 um, during our third submission of our SOI um, regarding um, the middle schools that the town also appropriated $1.5 million to uh, the feasibility study. And it was then when we were invited into the eligibility period from the MSBA that they recognized that there were needs at both middle schools, and therefore they approved the study not only of Bird, but for combined enrollments. So enrollments both at Bird and Johnson combined, because they recognized the need for that. In 2019, the feasibility study, we had the invitation into the feasibility program, and we um, had an agreement with MSBA for that feasibility agreement. And those feasibility study uh, studies, they carefully examined the potential solutions to the issues identified at the school facilities and really helped to develop the most cost-effective plan to address these issues. Looking at um, now where we're at at 2020-2021, it's really in that feasibility, but most importantly, the schematic design timeline. So in 2020, we secured our operating project manager, which was Compass, had approval from that, and the MSBA approved that. They also approved our designer selection, which is TAP-A. And then we submitted the preliminary design program. In 2020 and 2021, that's when the schematic design process began. 
and we submitted the report, the schematic design report, in July. And fortunately for us, it was a, it was a great day uh, in uh, August, August 25th, that the MSBA board approved the schematic design. As you can see there, too, we've had multiple community forums along the way, and there'll be uh, several more to come, and at the end, we'll put that up uh, on the, the community forums that'll be coming up. So um, we're really fortunate to work with te both Tepe and Compass, and as Mark said, you know, Compass has worked with the town on numerous projects, and uh, really coming in, what's nice is uh, on time, um, and in some cases, under budget. Um, just to note that you can see the amount of work that really has gone into this feasibility and schematic design um, process. And it, it goes towards the educational program. You can see the final decision regarding enrollment and then all the deliverables that are required for each process um, and even more so for the schematic design report. And we're really proud to, to state that you know, we did this even uh, it's a comprehensive process during a pandemic. Um, no less. So um, it, it's pretty impressive that all these deliverables were started and were delivered on time. What we were required to do through the MSBA is establish this comprehensive and thoughtful educational program that really articulated our educational goals and needs of the district. And most importantly, it provides for future flexibility in, that allows us to adapt to changes in programming or teaching methodologies for the life of the building. And we know in Walpole Middle School, we're really committed to educating students in this inclusive environment where our students have these equitable resources and these engaging opportunities to learn and thrive. And teaming is at the heart of the middle school philosophy. You'll see that um, numerous times through here, and it was numerous times in our, in our education plan. And the design of a combined middle school must promote this environment where students and staff and our families and our community members, they really come together to build um, these, these collaborative partnerships. In terms of the enrollment decision, um, you can see that school committee voted in December 2020 um, unanimously uh, to pursue this combined middle school enrollment of 905 students. And looking at that, those are just some of the bullet points of the, the rationale behind that. But really, a, a combined middle school um, lends itself to equitable access, right? All students are benefiting from a combined middle school. Um, having all middle schools and in-district programs is another example in one building maximizes our service and greater flexibility with regard to the delivery um, of our services. Teaming, again, in order for students to truly feel this sense of belonging and connection and then gain the social, emotional, and academic benefits of being in this small learning community in a larger fabric of a school. And really, we, we felt that they needed to be grouped in this clearly defined and consistent teaming that would, um, this building would allow us to create. And then improved school programming would result in this and related arts offerings. So a combined middle school allows us to utilize our staff to offer more robust related arts programs and after school programs that we couldn't do you know, due to the enrollment we have. And then of course, a combined middle school, um, we found that was significantly more cost effective than building separate projects. And it would require, um, if you look at it, it says eight years um, to complete a second project with MSBA funding. Now my favorite part, the rendering. Um, when you look at these, these, some of these renderings, um, the, the school um, is 162,193 square feet. There's 45 classrooms, five per team, with three teams per grade. Um, again, the neighborhoods, the sense of community. And um, there's a separated car bus loop, circulation loop, um, event, an overflow parking, and a new entrance to East Street. That's just another um, design. From the schematic rendering. Looking at the floor plans, again, um, neighborhoods. Neighborhoods was mentioned in the ed plan 79 times, and then teaming was mentioned about 140 times. 
So you can see this is really central to our middle school philosophy. It really equates to the building geography and it drives our core academic spaces. And again, it's organized, and you see the three floors, but it's organized by three grade level teams, three teams per grade. And you have support of that approach to, to curriculum delivery, has these flexible learning spaces, our special education programs, our academic support programs, all of these spaces are an inherent part of our, of our neighborhood. Um, the neighborhood also contains four um, general ed classrooms and then a dedicated science classroom and then a STEAM, which is a science, technology, engineering, arts, and math to really facilitate um, inquiry, presentation, project-based learning, um, and this authentic real-world experiences. Um, neighborhoods should really have this feeling of home and that they are in comfortable and safe environments, sending a message to students that they're part of this small learning community and in turn that's committed to the fabric of a larger school. What's great about the building um, that was designed, it maximizes and enhances greater flexibility in regard to the delivery, service delivery of all students. Um, builds a stronger learning environment. Um, equitable access to 21st century learning environments and programming. So 100% of the students are going to benefit from this updated technology. Um, looking at technology labs, technology literacy labs, computer science labs, multimedia and video presentations. Um, these labs are really interactive. They're immersive, virtual reality platforms. So they're learning skills to address the unique design of these challenges and create authentic solutions. Um, it enables us, for example, to build our robotics program, um, our middle school media production program. Both of those feed into the high school. And the high school has a robust robotics program, as you know, and a robust media program. Um, we look at all different labs of science labs. You may have um, hydroponics or, or sol solar energy conservation really promoting like our next generation if we look at our environmental and biological sciences as they get up to um, the high school. Outdoor learning spaces. They're not only used for recreational use, but here they'll be designed that they can provide project space, um, social space, outdoor classrooms. Um, really enable students to be engaged in, and we keep saying meaningful, exciting programs that improve their communities. Um, and to be hold, held classes outside in terms of allowing performances, a, a family venue. And speaking of family performances, there's a dedicated auditorium. Um, that will also house our large music programs. Every student right now in the middle school takes a music. So um, there'll need to be a class on the, on the stage. We have a robust drama program at both middle schools. And then also to allow community-based performing art groups um, to come in. Looking at the dining area, centralized kitchen, the outreach, so we're accommodating they're both the school and the community for education partnerships. So the central kitchen, centralized kitchen and cafeteria is utilized to provide also vocational opportunities for our special education programming. Um, this space allows for job training and hands-on learning for our students, and that partnership is really an integral part to our inclusion program. And then finally, the gym, um, we're taking two middle school gyms um, from Bird and Johnson, creating one larger gym. And then there's also a teaching station that's shared, um, going to be shared with our special education program. So um, it allows for occupational therapy, physical therapy. So it, that's also a dedicated and shared space. So it promotes inclusion among all of our, all of the peers. And the visioning sessions, um, overwhelmingly express this strong desire to build a school that allows for community access. And this school, um, the design does a great job because um, you look at your, your gym, your cafeteria, your auditorium, that has a separate, separate entrance, separate access. So it provides performances, um, gathering spaces, athletic spaces that can be accessed by the community um, after school, on weekends, and during the summer months. So um, that, that, was, that was a big ask and um, for all of um, our community members, so we were able to, to design it that way. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Okay. Okay. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, Brian Jarvis, Senior um, Director for Compass Project Management. Um, I think I know most of you in this room. If you don't know me, um, I am a resident. I live right down the street. Both of my boys did attend uh, Bird Middle School. My oldest son just graduated high school in 2020, and my youngest son is currently a sophomore uh, at Walpole High. Uh, I've been in Walpole for over 20 years now. Um, and I was senior project manager on the fire station, police station, and the Council on Aging project. So um, I've done some work in the town as well. I get to talk about all the fun stuff. Um, Bridget got all the pic pictures. Uh, sustainability, energy efficiency. So um, the movement in school construction, uh, as well as general construction, is towards higher sustainability in buildings, higher energy efficiency. Um, the state has a bunch of mandates out there that all public construction, all buildings are going to need to meet uh, in certain timelines. And that has taken a hold in all of school construction with towns trying to look forward uh, in designing their buildings to meet those mandates. Uh, obviously, you don't do school projects all the time. So kind of your one um, bite at the apple, so to speak. So as far as this building goes, it, it will be targeting a lead silver, if you're familiar with the leadership in energy environmental design. Um, has a lot of different aspects of sustainability. It's just not related to energy efficiency. It goes into recycled materials, location that materials are coming from, um, et cetera, in, a well, in addition to energy efficient systems. Um, the systems in the building are currently designed to 20 plus percent more efficient than the mass energy code. Um, that's significant because from the MSBA's reimbursement perspective, that starts to trigger some additional reimbursement from the MSBA. So right now we are in line um, to receive 2% additional reimbursement points from the MSBA, and we'll talk through that detail in a little bit. Um, and we're also partnering, partnering with Eversource and Mass Save. They have a bunch of programs out there that building projects can take part in uh, to receive either rebates or one-time incentives. So we're currently in their path one uh, path, which would lead to potential uh, incentives during design and then also after construction is over during occupancy when the building is actually being uh, trended for how it's actually performing. Net zero energy, some of you might be familiar with that term. Uh, we're, we're targeting a net zero ready building, um, which means that we are looking forward uh, to what the state mandate targets are. I believe the time horizon on that is 2050. And the key piece to net zero energy is it's not necessarily means that you're off the grid entirely. It just means that the building or the site is able to produce renewable energy um, that will offset your annual consumption. So it doesn't mean you have no energy bill during the year. It just means by the end of the year, you've produced enough. So the key last component to net zero energy is actually renewable energy. So whether that's photovoltaics or geothermal wells, um, right now the project is being designed for future photovoltaics. And as the town decides or the district decides what's best uh, for the school or for all the schools, et cetera, uh, the building will be ready um, to accept those types of systems. As you saw on the site plan, I don't know if you could tell by the sun um, on that site plan, but it, is, has, it does have an optimal solar orientation, which helps with obviously all the energy efficiency systems, especially related to heating and cooling. Um, it does have a highly insulated envelope. It will have all electric H HVAC systems, LED lightings, and controls to maximize operating efficiency. So every building that we're building these days um, is at this standard. Um, if not more, some towns are much more aggressive. They have policies in place. They have programs in place uh, related to renewable energy and things of that nature. So I think this building is being positioned well uh, to be ready for when Walpole moves in that direction. If that's during the project or shortly thereafter, this building will be ready um, to talk about renewable energies. Project budget, budget and MSBA funding. So um, if you've seen any of the presentations recently or any of the information through the building committee, the estimated total project budget, so that's everything, construction plus soft costs, architects, designer, um, OPM costs, furniture, everything is in the $115.7 million budget. Uh, that was per the schematic design estimate. So we did a full estimate on construction costs at the end of schematic design, updated a total project budget, and then sent that into the MSBA board. That was approved on August 25th, as Dr. Goff uh, mentioned. That includes the auditorium, a central kitchen, the third gym space, and CM at risk delivery method. Uh, MSBA stated reimbursement, and we have more slides if you have questions later on tonight. So the MSBA basically, in their um, original schematic and feasibility agreement with the town of Walpole, um, gave the town of Walpole an estimated base rate of 48.68% reimbursement, and that gets applied to all eligible costs. And the MSBA has a lot of criteria with which what is eligible and what is ineligible on a project. So it's not all costs, 
it's what's deemed in, it's what's deemed eligible by the MSBA, and we can answer some of those questions if we have those tonight. Um, we talked about getting the additional 2% for energy efficiency, as well as they look at all of the town's maintenance programs that they have in place for their school buildings to see how well towns maintain programs, and they assign an, an additional one to two points. So we got a 1.54 in addition to that. So we got a three and a half additional points basically uh, from the MSBA to bring the stated reimbursement rate up to 52.22. Um, as I mentioned, that's on all eligible costs, but on every project, regardless of the town, regardless of the building, not all costs are deemed eligible by the MSBA for a variety of reasons. So this is not a unique thing to Walpole, it's on every project. And at the end of the day, you act, what do you actually realize back from the MSBA? So when you calculate all of that out, um, it comes back to about 32% of total project budget. So 32% of 115 leaves the town share, so to speak, of about 77 million. So at the end of the day, that's what we're projecting um, based on the MSBA's estimated maximum facilities grant that the town would actually have to fund uh, for the duration of the, of the bond. Um, however, the MSBA makes towns approve the entire budget um, prior to starting the project. So the town is gonna vote on that 115 and then at the end of the day, what is, what is left over after all reimbursements is what they'll actually fund. It's good to know, um, however, that unlike the old process that the MSBA have, they actually reimburse the towns during the project. So every month we're actually doing it right now or we were doing it in the early stages of design. We'll submit all of the costs expended for that month in the MSBA. They'll audit that and then they'll send back reimbursements for the 52% or whatever is deemed eligible for that particular month. So the town is receiving reimbursements all through the project. They do cap it at 95% and they make you wait for that final payment until that final payment until the entire project's complete. And at Compass, we, we help you through with all of that. We've processed hundreds of millions of dollars to the MSBA in the last 10 years. We've done over 20, 25 school projects with them. Something to think about with the MSBA. So this is what uh, Mark alluded to in the beginning. And it's tough to see, but it's a lot of information. Um, this is actually on their website. If you go to the MSBA's website and they have a, a tab to the left, say building with us, and you click on that, you actually get down to another link, which brings you to this chart that they update regularly with all of the submitted project information that comes in from all of their projects. Um, long story short, this you can't see the numbers at the bottom, but this is really the last um, 10 years or so with the MSBA. The first orange dot all the way to the left is the new Norwood High School, which was Compass's first project. Um, and you can see where construction costs have gone over the last 10 years with orange squares being completed projects. So the cost of buildings for a variety of reasons has continued to rise um, pacing with the market. Uh, the orange line is really the average cost for that particular year or that particular cycle with the MSBA projects. Those rectangular outlines are really the different cycles that the MSBA has when they invite people into the process and they keep updating those numbers with the first, with the first estimate, the schematic design estimate, what you actually get for a bid, what you actually complete a project with. Um, and you can see Walpole right now uh, is pointed out there in the middle. We're slightly below the average cost of the school projects in the current cycle with the MSBA. Uh, the, the jobs cluster around that are some elementary school projects. So it's, it's also significant to note that this is a middle school versus an elementary school. Middle schools are typically a little bit more expensive square foot costs. And then the red arrow is actually pointing to something significant. The green line is what the MSBA funds on a dollar per square foot basis. So when they look at eligible costs, they actually cap the cost of construction. It used to be $333 per square foot and they just upped it to 360 this past June. So we actually got a huge benefit by that. Um, so additional $33 per square foot. They're not saying that you can build a building for $360 a square foot. They're just saying, we're only gonna pay you up to $360 a square foot. If your building costs 500 or 600, then the difference is ineligible. So that's kind of how they get that total project budget down to that $77 million number. So again, not a Walpole situation. That's, that happens on every single project. Uh, the benefit for Walpole is they did make that change in June. So we are picking up some additional reimbursement from them. And the top, I think the top square in that box is the Clark Elementary School in Boston, which is a significantly expensive project for a lot of reasons, mostly related to it has no, no available site. Everything is vertical, very expensive to build. So how does that uh, town share translate into an estimated tax impact? Uh, so we did run this exercise. This has been out there for a while. It's been talked about the uh, building committee for a few months. Uh, when you look at it, roughly $78 million, uh, assuming a 30 year term at three and a half percent borrowing rate, which is fairly conservative at this point, but that's what we're using. What does that do uh, to the average assessed value in Walpole, which is just over $556,000. Uh, 
Um, and you can see it comes in right, right between um, 423, 450 um, a year. So that's 438 per resident tax impact. Um, obviously, if the home value, is, assessed value is lower or higher, you can, and you can do the math. Um, but that's at the end of the day what this project is projected uh, to be to the taxpayer at that presumed uh, borrowing rate without, without any other variables. So there's other things related to uh, existing debt, et cetera, et cetera. So that's not taken into consideration. That's kind of just straight what this project looks like in a vacuum. And that's significant when you look at some of the other projects that are going on. We actually have some involvement in um, these projects. Westwood Elementary School, um, it's the Hanlon School, they're actually combining two elementary schools, so two out of their three. Um, they're building that project and the impact to their residents is um, 4591, uh, and that's based on a 4% borrowing rate, which again is probably conservative. Um, but that's what they're seeing there for an enrollment of 560. Medfield is not our project, but um, some of our colleagues actually sit on the Medfield Building Committee. Uh, Medfield, obviously, with a lot lower commercial base, has a much uh, higher impact per resident and also with a smaller population. Uh, so that's for their elementary school, the Dale Elementary School, and then the Walpole Middle School project. So similar to what your neighbors are seeing. Uh, we're also on the Norwood, pro Norwood Middle School project. They're going to be rebuilding the Coakley School. Um, they haven't yet done this calculation, but they're... Um, I think they're going to be similar to Walpole, if not a little bit, um, a little bit higher, uh, based on the size of school that they're building. But they also have a much bigger commercial base. What are the next steps? So, uh, as Dr. Goff mentioned, we got approved by the MSBA for our schematic design report in August. Um, that triggers two things from the MSBA. They send out what is called a scope and budget agreement, and that is the agreement, or basically the contract with the town that the MSBA is signing up for. This is the scope, this is the budget, this is the schedule. Um, the town sends out that, they send out that document to the town. That's one of the items that will get executed um, post a favorable town meeting. We actually received the draft last Thursday. Uh, there's a second agreement that comes out, which is the funding agreement, which is all the finances behind that. And that locks in uh, the, the budget and it also locks in the estimated maximum facility grant from the MSBA and uh, the reimbursement details. So they just, again, two separate contracts uh, they go hand in hand and they get executed post town meeting. Um, so you have 120 days from that approval at the MSBA board to, to get the project funded and approved and then submit those documents back. Uh, so which is why the, the timing of town meeting is critical and how the projects are scheduled so they line up uh, to fall within that window. So we're on schedule for that. And then once uh, assuming an approved project and those agreements are executed, the town can then start submitting to the MSBA for reimbursement during the design process. So as I mentioned earlier, every month we'll resubmit whatever cost the project has into the MSBA and they'll start resubmitting at that 52.22%. And then overall project timeline, if approved, full design would begin right away in November, uh, moving into design development through the fall, late fall of um, next year. Uh, one of the things that's being considered for this project and with the CM at risk delivery method um, is an early construction package, possibly next summer. And as you saw on the site plan, um, getting the access road in from E Street and also setting up the site during the summer when the school is not in session, as far as getting construction fence, temporary parking, um, rerouting some of the bus drop-off, parent drop-off loops, et cetera, prior to the start of school in 2022 uh, would be an asset. Uh, so that's something that is currently being um, planned and is currently, that's how the project is set up, including the budget. Full construction would start that fall, uh, mid to late 2022, after we um, bid out all of the trade packages. Construction is, a, is estimated to last uh, 32 months, plus or minus. So that, that would include that early package, as well as, obviously, once the new building is built, this building would have to be demolished and build the parking lots, et cetera. Um, so there's three phases, the enabling phase, the new build, and then demo site finish. New building is targeted to open for the fall of 2024, so I think that's current second graders would be the first ones through, if I'm not mistaken. Um, third graders, okay, third graders would be the first one in um, as sixth graders, correct? Or at graduating eighth graders? Something like that, as sixth graders. Okay, so uh, the third graders would be the first full class. Um, project complete, so that includes demo and the parking lots. So we're seeing early 2025, because again, depending on what that weather looks like at the end of 2024, the final landscaping, et cetera, might have to wait till spring. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the MSBA final audit, so they basically cap all reimbursements at 95%. So when you hit that threshold, you continue to submit 
cost to the MSBA, but they hold everything and do a final audit at the, at the end of the project, which is after you do lead submissioning, a 10-month follow-up commissioning process, et cetera, can take up to a year sometimes. Uh, so we're targeting possibly early 2026 to get that final reimbursement check back from the MSBA. Uh, more information to stay informed. Uh, obviously, we're here tonight. We're also looking to do updates for the seniors and general public as a council on aging next uh, next week. We have a community forum uh, open to the public in person. Uh, we've done several previous ones on Zoom. Uh, it'd be good to get people out in person if we can on the 28th at Johnson. We're going to do another one back here on the 19th of October. Uh, we're also building that as kind of a town meeting prep, encouraging town meeting members to come out, get as many questions answered ahead of time if possible, have some discussions, um, and then obviously town meeting on 1023. Uh, we are talking about it, optional tours of both existing middle schools prior to those forums, so we're working out those details. We will have some advertisements coming out uh, next week uh, to all residents, whether it's the postcard that we've done on some of the other community forums, also doing an ad in Hometown Weekly, just so folks get uh, word of these events uh, in addition to whatever is advertised on the website, et cetera, and through social media. And just staying informed, I think most of you know these um, links. Obviously, the website is through the school's website. There's a subpage there with um, a lot of the documentation, if not all of the documentation that's been handed out to date in all of the presentations. There's also uh, videos of all the building committee meetings and community forums, uh, the five previous ones, if you want to watch those. Uh, the MSBA's website is there. Um, that's a good resource if you want to see what other towns are doing, what some of the costs are. They have all of the historical data for every school project ever ever done uh, through their program. And you can email the team. So um, this comes directly to the core project team. If you have a specific question, um, we will definitely get back to you um, and try to answer that. I think we're going to pause here and uh, take questions afterwards. Thanks. Do we have any questions now? Or? Um, yeah, let's do questions now. Okay. If anybody's got questions, they can come to one of these two mics and queue up. Hi, thank you for that great presentation. My uh, quick question is the interest rate assumption, if I, if I caught that, was that 3.5% over 30 years? Yes. And uh, I wonder if that's, is that conservative, would you say? Because it seems like municipal borrowing rates over 30 years are quite low. If we're borrowing 1% at the five to 20 year range, how much would you, how much have recent projects been uh, for 30-year borrowing? Um, I can speak to a couple of projects that I'm involved with. I mean, they are seeing they are seeing rates closer to two, you know, give or take. Um, the low side, of, you know, high side of one's low side of two. But again, it's all based on the town's ratings. Sure. Um, so I would say at this point, you know, 3.5 percent could be considered conservative. Um, and then the goal would be to update that, you know, with more accurate forecasts the closer you get to town meeting. Great. Thanks. Yeah, we do. We have some backup slides if maybe they help. Hi, a uh, couple questions. I, I agree with Andrew. Probably three point five is probably conservative, a little high based on current markets. But who knows when they go for money? Uh, what's the plans for Johnson? Yeah. Um, towns are going to have to study that as far as what they want to do with that. I think right now there's there's no plans to demolish it. Um, they'd have to go into um, a little more detail as far as what potential uses could be. It's not going to be demoed. It's going to be kept in Currently, it's not part of this project, no, as far as demolition. Okay. Uh, the head count, uh, I think um, the superintendent mentioned 905 now. What's the trend been for the last, say, five years, and what do you project it to be? Uh, I don't know if that's available, but just ask him. Um, do you have, I don't know if we have one that goes into that. Do you want the comparison? Uh, yeah, so um, so one of the first things that the MSBA does with the eligibility period, uh, let's see if we can get the. So in the eligibility period, the the um, 
MSBA makes the district go through, they have a whole process for how they determine enrollment, uh, which looks at a lot of different factors, which is the uh, trends in the historical enrollment within the town, uh, the town's current um, anticipated uh, construction, whether that's uh, residential, um, they're looking at long-term projects that could impact the school, they're looking at all the state um, health and data records regarding uh, birth rates, they're looking at um, national trends as well, um, and then they also build in a kind of a, a buffer uh, for enrollment. So it's a pretty um, detailed process with the MSBA because they're also making sure that what they're investing in is, is going to last and not be something where you, you know, outgrow the size of the building immediately after occupancy. So um, there is a rare occasion where something kind of slips through the cracks there and um, doesn't happen very often, uh, you, know, you know, if at all, but they do put through a very rigorous process to come up with the enrollment. So at 9.05 now, what is the projected capacity of the proposed school? The Mark? That, that is the capacity. Yep. So when it opens, there will be somewhere under 800 students. But projecting new construction and so forth, it would allow for expected growth in 9.05. Oh, okay, 9.05. Okay. And what, what's the trend been over the last five years? Have we gone from 650, 700, now we're at 8, as Mark mentioned, 800? Approximately, I mean, it's a, bit, it's a trend going up. It, it depends. Like, it, it's hard to tell with the pandemic because the pandemic, you know, certain people have have gone or homeschooled last year, so students are, are now coming back. I think between now and and two months ago, we've had 50 new registrations. Um, tents. Um, when we when we've talked to administrators or superintendents at other new schools that they've built, especially middle schools. They found that the enrollment has increased because everybody now wants to go to that school, and and you'll see the enrollment go up. Thanks. Uh, will there be more staffing required? Uh, is there? I get part of the uh, process here is there efficiency. So is there going to be efficiencies in staffing levels, or you because of the student population growth of the services you offer, you may need more help. It, it depends. It depends um, when you look at certain staffing, I mean, if you're consolidating, there might be with staffing that may not need as much, but then depending on if you want to build certain programs, so you're, you're taking a look and trying to figure out where that staffing is, is best placed. So that's our that's our next stage. Okay, that has, that's still to be mapped. Out. Correct. Okay, got it. Um, with COVID and all that, um, Brian's probably a few HVAC and things of that nature. How's that being incorporated into this new design? And I know a lot of these energy efficient, I, I, re I see it in residential construction, a lot of these residential buildings are so tight because of the energy efficiency, they don't breathe in a sense. And sometimes it becomes uh, toxic in a sense because of fibers from furniture, carpets, whatever become a, a problem for people with asthma and things like that. So is that and with COVID, is that being somehow plugged into this, this design? Yes, yeah, so you, you have a couple of things there. Um, so with the, the furniture and everything, the off-gassing, so these buildings typically go through a flush-out period as part of commissioning. So the goal would be to set the project up so at the end of the project that all of the finishes are in place and they actually run those systems with fresh air for a certain amount of times. Um, it's dependent on each, each um, unit depending on the space it serves, how long it needs to run to basically flush all of that out of the system. Uh, there is a whole sequencing of filters that go on these types of systems um, that could change out after construction, you know, after flush out type of thing. And then the way that this system is designed is um, fresh air makeup in all of these systems and then the, the filters in associated with any of these units are the MERV 13, you know, type filters that are much more robust than what you would typically see in an older unit. Um, so from a COVID perspective, I think that the systems are much more um, adapted to the, those types of situations where you're getting much more fresh air and, and recirculation and uh, cycling of fresh air throughout the building. Um, in addition to that, just the square footage uh, that you have in the in the spaces, because a lot of the classrooms are undersized in the current building. So as far as setting up spaces where you can actually have some distancing in classrooms and, and spread those things out, you, you'd have um, more flexibility, more capacity in the newer space to do that. Um, I, I get you talked about solar. You, uh, you know, teeing it up for solar. Why wouldn't we want to go solar out of the gate? It's a possibility. I mean, I think that's in the town or the district's court of what they want, might want to do as a district wide, because there's some advantages to whether you buy it directly, if you get into some type of agreement with 
uh, the utilities because you're putting it on multiple buildings. Um, and the fact that that just isn't necessarily sorted out yet within the district or the town, um, the decision right now is get the building prepped for that. And then if you end up deciding to put it in the project, you put it in the project, and, or if you do it afterwards, you're ready. Um, what is not eligible for reimbursement? Because I saw it go from, you started at 48, 50% range, and, and then it kind of stepped down to 32%. So I'd be curious what's not reimbursed. Uh, so the biggest one is the difference in square foot cost for construction. So the MSBA shaves that difference off, you know, from the 360 to whatever your project costs. So those school projects that are up in the 600, 700, they have $400 right off the top from the construction costs that are deemed ineligible. And that kind of reduces the amount that the MSBA is looking at uh, from their um, percentages. But there's really a couple of different categories. Um, categorically ineligible uh, costs that exceed MSBA caps or any spaces that might exceed the MSBA square foot guidelines. So the MSBA um, categorically, so these are things that basically don't have anything to do with your educational program. Um, there are exceptions to those things. Um, so basically the school comes in and says, hey, we want to build a, a boat building class or something because we think it's cool. And they think, well, that's great, but that's kind of on your dime. Now they do make exceptions for that. They allowed the boat building workshop in Marshall because they, they had a history of that. It's supported by the ed, ed program. Um, items that are not part of the permanent building or ground. So a lot of times out, out on the site, um, things like you know temporary storage facilities or something that might not be part of that building that's kind of a temporary thing. Um, temporary facilities or temporary operations, swing space type stuff typically are ineligible. Um, and anything that's beyond the project scope. So if you're doing, um, hey, we, we ruined the front yard here, we ruined the soccer field here, we want to build a soccer field on the other side of town, they're going to say, well, that's not part of the project, that soccer field's ineligible, even though it might have been eligible on the project had it been on the site. Uh, costs that exceed MSBA caps, so they set caps on a lot of different items, one being the construction square foot cost, which we already talked about. They also have um, a site work cap of 8% of construction, and this is, this is the MSBA's way of trying to balance districts, so kind of districts were able to do one type of project versus districts that have a different type, and also balancing sites. Um, so like a site cap, for instance, they look at the site cost on a project if anything over 8% of total construction is deemed ineligible. Um, they have caps on the OPM fee, they have caps on the designer fee. So that's all baked into that equation. They have caps on the FF&E. Um, some districts um, choose to exceed some of those caps for different reasons. Um, and they, anything that was above that cap would be deemed ineligible. And then spaces that exceed square foot guidelines. So they have um, guidelines for every space in the building. And we, when we put our program together, we compare that to the MSBA's guideline spaces. Uh, so some of the spaces here, for instance, we had a third gym space. Typically, they give you the one gym space, but we were able to support that with our curriculum and our educational plan and the need. Um, they supported that. Our classroom spaces, because of the teaming structure, we actually have more general classrooms than what the MSBA prescribed for middle school, but it's supported by the way that middle school is taught in Walpole. And similarly, across a lot of districts, they supported those additional spaces as well, deemed those to be eligible. Um, so there are, and there are things that are um, category ineligible per scope. You know, the, the big one here is obviously the auditorium. That's something the MSBA doesn't think is part of a uh, middle school curriculum. Other districts disagree as well, and they opt to put that in um, for the benefits of their program on a, on a variety of levels. Um, and these are some of those other examples, category ineligible, swing space, as I mentioned, off-site improvements, um, as, asbestos floor tiles. For some reason, they have that called out as just something that, hey, every school is going to be a little bit different. Um, they don't want to have anything to do with that, so they, they pull that out. Synthetic turf for playing fields. They basically reimburse you for a grass field. When you go to synthetic, if these days they still deem that ineligible. Um, cost exceeding caps, as I mentioned, OPM, designer, the building cost, site cost above 8%, furniture technology. Change orders is one I forgot to mention. During construction, the MSBA will reimburse you up to 1% of eligible change orders. So if you have a change order to a contractor and it's for an eligible scope of work, they will audit that, they will reimburse you your percentage rate, and once that reimbursement amount reaches 1%, then they cap their reimbursements on change 1 orders. 1% of the total. Regardless if the next change order is for something that would have been totally eligible. Um, so again, that estimated that estimated grant that you see from the MSBA, there still is a little bit of audit room in there for them. It's not going to change much, um, but that's one of the reasons like during construction that you could have it differ a little bit. And then guideline spaces, as I mentioned, um, two, the two big areas on this project were the additional core academic spaces in the third gym, both were deemed eligible by the MSBA. So that was a, that was a win for Walpole. A part, and maybe I missed it. How much is you estimate our cost per square foot? Five, right now it's 570. 570, 570 and they give us 360 approximately. 
So when they look at it from a construction yeah. perspective, they give you 360, they take the delta off the top. Does right? that include a contingency? Um, that does not include the construction contingency. The construction contingency would get applied towards the change orders. And and how is there a breakout of how things that are ineligible would cost if we factor those out? Is there like if uh, the, the auditorium, if that wasn't part of the, the scope? Um, we had done that comparison. Uh, we had done that comparison back prior to the decision of to go forward with an auditorium or not. Um, and the difference of having the auditorium from again from the MSBA's perspective, which is kind of a straight calculation, it's not a, it's not exactly a, a one to one. You take out the auditorium and you reduce the project. Because for instance, for in Walpole's case, if you took out the auditorium, you still have to, they would make you do a cafetorium, right? So right now, the, our cafeteria doesn't have a stage in it because we have an auditorium. So they'd make you put the stage back in, and that would increase your square footage cost by the size of the stage, which increases your construction cost, which is then hit with that three hundred and sixty dollars. We have a music room. We have a music class that's going to be um, performing on the stage for class. So you'd have to build an additional music room um, to house that music class. So you'd have that additional square footage. So it's not exactly a one-to-one, -one, but it obviously would be less expensive without the auditorium. When we did the cafeteria cafetorium analysis, um, the town share came in just about 74, 75 million. Um, so that was the decision point for the building committee that for roughly about four million, five million dollars um, total, uh, you'd be able to do the auditorium, which equates to whatever that yellow line is there, the $17 or $15 difference between the tax impact. Okay, four or five million. Okay. Um, um, and you, uh, let's see. Uh, is this, uh, uh, do they require a union, non-union? How does that work? Uh, For the construction? Yeah. Um, no, there's no requirement union or non-union. You can have, I mean, it ends up being, this will be seen at risk, they'll uh, sign up whoever they have agreements with, uh, whether it's union or non-union. Uh, but it is required to be prevailing wage. Prevailing wage, yeah. Okay. If, that's, if that's what you meant. If you took out the auditorium or whatever and lowered the amount a little bit, would MSBA um, give more percentage or it'd still be the same, basically 32, 33%? It's relatively close. It's, it was okay. a difference of 32 to about, you're about right, to about 33, 34%. Good, thank you. I appreciate your time. I got a couple of quick questions. Um, you're talking about ineligible costs. Um, I believe the demo of this building would be considered an ineligible cost. Ineligible or eligible? Ineligible. Um, it's part of the project, but we need yeah. to take it down to finish the project, so it would okay. be deemed eligible. Yep. Oh, it is. Okay. Do you have a budget breakdown of the components of what you anticipate being demo of this building versus site work versus construction costs? Um, yeah, we have a budget breakdown. I don't know if it's that level. Well, my concern was was that in the evaluation of this building, did they determine that yes, we're going to be dealing with removal of hazardous material because we have asbestos tile. We may or may not have lead paint buried under yep. structures. So that's all. Yeah. Place. So there was a, there was a couple rounds of investigation and surveys to come up with what we think uh, would be included in this building and the cost for. Um, yeah, the fifth line item down there, uh, in building hazardous material and abatement, there's a whole line item just for that, okay. separate from the demolition. Okay. Yeah, so both of those are included in the cost. Okay. Um, but as I mentioned, there is, the MSBA does call out the asbestos tile as ineligible, um, just one of their category of ineligible items. The removal of or the, or removal the slowing of. of? Removal of, yep. Okay, okay. Um, other items going back to enrollment, you're talking about 45 classroom spaces, so student population of 20 kids to a class would give you your 900. Do those, most of those rooms, would they have the capacity to add two or three more desks if needed if the school did all of a sudden become a 930 or 940 population? Yes. So there is that wiggle room. So 20 is our, what the school board would like to see 20 kids in a class, but we do have room to grow. We have four more kids to a classroom. Yeah, I think right now we're running somewhere between 20 and 21, like 20 point something kids per class. MSBA guidelines is up to 24 plus a teacher okay. in classrooms. So yeah, we have the wiggle room in each of the classrooms. If, if I could add as well, keep in mind that not every classroom is necessary. 
necessarily use every period of the day. Right. Yep. So there would be this, this building has room to grow. Yes. Okay. Yep. MSBA will not let you build a building that you're asking to add on to in ten years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other good questions? Um, can you explain, you know, we're, you're going into final design in the fall, um, and then we're going to construct a year from now, but we're voting on this in a couple of weeks. So how do we ensure that that $150 million cost that we have now doesn't escalate over the next year? Doesn't escalate. So there's escalation built in the estimates. Yeah. So based on the current market conditions, then we actually have an escalation factor of, I think it's 7%, 8% on top of what we're seeing currently for market. So we do have construction escalation already built into those estimates. Um, so there's a possibility that, you know, maybe the, the markets recover a little bit. Um, but to your question of maintaining the budget, so the project budget is the project budget. The MSBA's reimbursement is not going to change, not going to give you 52% of a more expensive project. Um, so that will become, during design will be several rounds, you know, if needed, of those cost control measures, value engineering, whatever you want to call it, um, at the different estimate points. We'll be doing another estimate. Um, at the end of design development, so like the March time frame, we'll be doing one halfway through construction documents early summer, and we'll be doing a final one at 90% construction documents. So we'll have uh, three more estimates prior to bidding out the subcontractors. And then uh, right now, seem at risk, we'll have this uh, construction manager on board sometime in the spring. We'll also be doing uh, live estimating based on their databases uh, and helping us with those cost control measures. Do you have a, a current construction estimate just for the building, not including soft costs? Uh, yes, I think. So the MSP, so this, if you haven't seen this, this is actually the spreadsheet, and there's three other pages that go with this with kind of the logic behind some of these cells that goes into the MSBA, and this is the massive spreadsheet broken across a couple of different PowerPoints. Uh, so the MSBA makes you break all of this down, starting at the top, kind of chronologically with the project. So the first couple lines are the feasibility 1.5 that the town previously approved, which is what we're um, the project is spending in, against now, and then the rest of it is the rest of it is th this page is designer costs, um, excuse me, OPM costs through design, uh, designer um, costs through design and construction, and then we get into construction. So we do have construction right now broken down by the assemblies. Uh, so in uniform format, so the superstructure, the roof, the exterior enclosures, uh, interior, all the MEP systems, uh, all the equipment, uh, site work, site preparation, uh, which spits out a construction cost of roughly $92.5 million out of the 115. That's at the very bottom there. And then you can see to the right, circled in red, uh, this was one of the, um, this was the update to the, this slide was actually from the update to the building committee on August 10th, but we had looked at our projected budgets to the MSBA at the meetings at the end of June and July. And you can see that item circled in red, the 29.3, that's the difference that the MSBA takes to their, against their $360 a square foot and takes it right off the 92 million. It says we're dealing with a, you know, 70 um, something million dollar construction budget. Do you want to explain the design impressions that you're using in addition, addition to the escalation? Yep. That's, that's yeah, so another, another aspect of contingency and escalation is currently we're in schematic design, so about 30% of the full design, right? So very difficult to have an exact number because everything hasn't been designed yet. So in the estimate also includes a design contingency of, I think we're at 12%. So basically that includes... And is that on the project or just the estimated construction? That's on the construction, and that's basically to cover items that haven't been designed yet. So we know we're going to do this, but we just have a placeholder or we have just this HVAC equipment, we don't have all of the details and bells and whistles designed out yet, so they can't actually do quantity takeoffs. So there's a design pricing estimate that's in that in that budget. So as we do iterations of the construction estimate, in theory, the, the cost and the known cost and the quantities come come higher, and that design contingency comes down inversely. So that's also baked into uh, the contingency of the budget right now as well. Um, getting back to the ineligible cost, how does that... Um, how does that work? You know, you, you start a project, you're, you're, and I'm, I'm not talking about the outside of the school versus demolition. I'm talking about the little nuts and bolts. Yep. How do people decide what eligible nuts or bolts we're going to use versus other things? You know, do these things go before the, the school building committee? Do, uh, you know, if you're going to use an LED light versus a regular light, you know, it's, I would assume that 
it's it's part of an eligible cost to have an LED light. But let's pretend it's not. You know, if if you decide to use this type of light versus that type of light, is it deemed ineligible, or is it, are those two low level? Yeah, they don't they don't get that granular with it. Granular with it. I mean, right now this is the this is actually the budget that we received back from the MSBA. So we submitted the budget. The purple cells are what the MSBA marked up, and they go through and they deem items to be ineligible. Oh, deemed to be ineligible based on those criteria that we showed you earlier. So they're not, they're not looking at that level. Basically what they're saying is you're going to build a building and it's going to spit out a construction cost. And then the way that they handle the LED versus a more expensive light fixture is your delta between your construction costs and that 360. So part of the design um, you know, directive is to build the building as cost effective as possible into all the materials, you know, balancing the what you need out of serviceability, maintainability, sustainability, you know, aesthetics, everything in the meeting of our program. So um, I think to date, we've actually done a pretty decent job with the exterior of the building um, and the in interior. We've been running that through facilities as far as getting materials that are cost effective yet durable. Um, but there's still a lot of that to go. Like as we start to get more detail in our design and more design estimates, we'll be looking at all of those things. I mean, everything from how many trees are you planting on the site to, you know, what is the finish of this particular wall in this space or, or options to help with that cost control if needed. Um, change order. How are those going to be reviewed in the future? Is it something that you make the call on? Do you bring it before the committee and the committee makes the call? Yeah, so the way that, the way that we handle uh, change orders in construction is that we um, track and manage all change orders. Uh, we basically report to the committee at a minimum once a month. It goes into all of our budget packages as our change order log, um, which is our interpretation, not the contractors or the architect. This is what we think is really out there because um, sometimes you don't know everything yet uh, from the contractor. Um, we keep them advised of this is everything that we know, this is everything that we think, this is the process of where this is in review. And then when we feel that we've reviewed it thoroughly with the architect, the contractor, and feel comfortable with, yes, this is a fair and reasonable price, um, you know, if it isn't rejected, uh, then we present that to the building committee for discussion. Um, and we did that on all the municipal projects. And it's not uncommon that, you know, several of them get kicked back, they have questions, they need more information. Um, and we bring it back a second, you know, a second time or a third time if needed. But yeah, we do not approve them ourselves. It's all through the committee. So everything will be public record and at the building committee meetings. Um, and I guess the final question, will this be a peer review as part of the final design? Yeah, there'll be multiple re uh, third party reviews. Um, so we typically do that a um, number of ways. Um, we have in-house capabilities um, with our own MEP, um, engineering staffs, architectural and structural. Uh, we also do those sometimes through third parties. So we'll actually have a, another architectural firm kind of review the plans. Uh, we also do that with the commissioning agent. So the MSBA actually hires commissioning agents directly for these projects. Uh, so they'll be on board during the design process, looking at MEP systems and building envelope systems, uh, offering their review of the design, all the comments. Those comments all get submitted formally as part of these deliverables to the MSBA. And then we need to get formal responses back to the MSBA that they vet through and make sure that those are satisfactory answers that they've been addressed. Uh, so there'll be several rounds of that. All right. mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Speaking first. What's that? Speaking first. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, you're brighter than I am. You probably had this question that I was going I appreciate the information about the cost of this project. I wonder if I can ask uh, through you some questions um, more generally about the project. Uh, the abutters are quite concerned about traffic on East Street, and I wonder what traffic studies have been done or what um, redirection of hardscape um, is in the works to make sure that pick up and drop off times and buses and pedestrians can all navigate that new entrance. Right, so um, what you see here is the current schematic site plan. And again, this is big picture for, for lack of a better term. There's still a lot of detail to go into some of these things. Um, there was a traffic study done um, at all the major intersections leading to the bird site. Um, so both the East Street and 27, High Plain in Washington, down at Poly, 
um, and then short in Washington. So all the major um, intersections, there's also additional historical information based on some of the other projects in town. Uh, so they did look at the current state of those projects and obviously bringing in an additional um, middle school population during pickup and drop off times doesn't necessarily improve those, pro those uh, intersections. Um, so one of the critical pieces of this project uh, for a variety of reasons was providing as much the term is porosity to the site, so giving um, pick up and drop off as much option as possible uh, to try to avoid having everyone have to go through the same intersection regardless of where they're coming from in town. Uh, so one of the solutions was to have the driveway out to East Street um, both directions. So again, if you can imagine, you know, right turn only maybe into that, and these details haven't been worked out yet, but these are some of the things that are being considered. So, you know, in the morning, right turn only coming in and right turn only leaving, so you don't have people trying to make that left turn. Um, bringing buses from that side of town in that way, but buses that traditionally come from Washington use that way. And again, that helps with a couple things. It helps with getting people in and out of the site as quickly as possible. It also extends the queuing on site so that you don't have people backed up at both of those intersections waiting to get out or you have these long lines trying to get out in traffic. So um, the details of how those, how that driveway looks kind of along the property line and things of that nature aren't defined yet. Um, but we do understand and we, we understand the neighbor's concerns. Um, but those are some of the things that, you know, in the finished product um, is really going to help um, streamline pick up and drop off. And, the, and the, the plan is you can see the yellow circle kind of in the middle there. That's intended to be a bus drop off loop. So the, the goal is to really to separate your bus traffic from your vehicle, your automobile traffic for safety reasons. Um, and what this plan does, and you can kind of make it out, but there's actually a raised kind of crosswalk speed calming um, crosswalk at along the sidewalk and then along the field that you know the buses can come up and come over that and get into the bus loop whereas uh, a pedestrian drop off can come up to that drop students up along the sidewalk and then take a left and then exit the site either through East Street or Washington Street whatever is most advantageous for them so, the, so there's a couple things happening here we're separating bus and uh, car traffic we're giving uh, vehicles as many options as possible to enter and exit the site and we're creating as much queue space as possible um, to keep those backups hopefully to a minimum. Let me just um, ask you on the queue space. That is such a buzzword with what's going on at Walpole High and the queuing on Common yep. Street. And I think people will be very, very upset if there's queuing on East Street. So the entrances on Washington and East Street will both have queue space? Yes, yeah, so you can actually see, I mean, the distance from Washington Street's on the right of the screen and East Street's on the left, the distance from there to actually getting to where someone would get out is a fairly good distance that could accommodate that line of cars. One of the things that the traffic study and engineers looked at was not doing the East Street exit and putting an additional entrance on Washington Street, kind of closer to the other property line, which, as you mentioned, the high school creates the issue now of multiple entrances at the same location, which sometimes backfires and creates more queuing because it's a lot of traffic. So. Um, the other key aspect of this driveway off of um, E Street is also to facilitate construction traffic because if not, then you'd have to bring the construction traffic in with all of the school traffic during construction. Um, doable, but obviously much, much better and much safer if you're isolating uh, construction traffic as much as possible from daily operations. Um, one of the other options that we're looking at during phasing is potentially um, having the the parent drop off being kind of in the existing area now and then also sending the buses kind of behind the school to exit the site as a temporary solution during construction. Again, whatever we can do to, to mitigate or eliminate school operation traffic crossing with construction traffic uh, would be beneficial. Um, yes, thank you. Another existential question. Um, I have had people in town ask, why aren't we doing this project on the high school? I've even heard a rumor that the high school is about to lose accreditation because the building is in such bad shape. Um, there's a school of thought that all the middle school students should go to the high school, which doesn't make sense if it's actually about to lose accreditation for being in disrepair. But in any case, some people saying the middle school should go to the high school and we should build a new high school. And um, maybe there's a straightforward, easy answer to that. we chose the, the site. I didn't have to say. First of all, we're not about to lose accreditation. So <laughs> thank I you. Can, I can go on record for that. 
yeah. <laughs> not even close. It, it was news to me as well. No, yeah, that, that, that's not true. Um, and um, you want to talk about the different like sites? I mean, is, is there another question of why why not? And and with Walpole Height and, and anybody in school committee or uh, Mike and Bill um, are, are welcome to answer too. Is um, we're not ignoring the high school. There's there's still work to be done. There's a you know we're working on a plan for the high school um, in order to. So it's not that okay we're going to have this you know m new middle school. And we're not thinking about the high school uh, whatsoever. Do you want to talk about? Yeah, we had um, an SOI. The first SOI that we submitted was high school, and the the MSBA rejected that. And go. then when we submitted in 2018, the middle schools they looked at the middle schools, and that was what was accepted. It was actually Bird Middle School. And with the potential of look, they would look at consolidation. You rejected it twice. Yeah. Yeah. Third time's a charm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Just actually, you just go back to the map for a second. Yeah. And just, um, just want so you understand, just. Kind of draw for me. Where is the current school? Uh, the current school is underneath where that parking lot is. So the bus loop and the trees, and then the the gray parking area below that. So the new school goes in basically in front of the current school. The new school goes in the current island in front of the school and around the corner. And then there's also a, a town-owned parcel to Page North where you see that loop at the top of the page. Okay. I thought one of the ideas of the MSBA program was to reduce school costs you were going they're going to have basically have a plan plan yep. a b c and d well, model, pick your plan model school will program. reimburse this yep. much of the plan so you don't get into all this design activity and everything why haven't we done that um, well, we actually did look at that for the model school program so they introduced that back in um, like the late 2000 2008 2009 um, Nord High School actually entered into the model school program. Mm -hmm. um, they used to give an additional 5% reimbursement uh, for that and uh, trying to encourage districts to use that. Um, they stopped doing that um, about four years ago, five years ago, giving the additional reimbursement. So you get no additional reimbursement to do that. Um, it's still an option, and we actually did look at this. So the way that the model school program works is that the MSBA approves designers and some um, schools that could potentially work as a model school in each of the different levels, high school, middle school, and elementary school. In the middle school level, there's only four model schools available, and you have to go with the designer of that school. Um, but you don't make that decision until you've already procured a designer. So TAPE does not have a model school. Um, that was one of the criteria, but it wasn't a deciding criteria, obviously. Um, the issue with some of the model schools is they're also different sizes. So of the four that are available, there were only two, and actually there's only one, the one in Lynn, uh, that was the same size school as the combined middle school for Walpole. So now you have one school to choose from. And the issue that a lot of districts find with the model schools is, while, yes, you could get some potential um, cost savings through maybe an efficient design process, it still takes the same amount of time to build it. So you're not really getting any savings from a construction perspective. And then okay, there's, so no, there's no, no huge cost savings to go with the model school. Now I'm curious with the yep. design that you have, is it based on any of the school systems that have followed the same design? Well, we, we went with a couple of things. We have our ed plan, so everything's reflected in the ed plan. It's like a 75-page document that we, we put together to show the vision and what the ed program should be for our 21st century education. But to your point of looking at other schools, um, we have traveled to multiple middle schools, talked to, we actually... Um, not only myself, but uh, Mike Frischa, school business administrator, went, uh, Nancy Gallivan, we've had a uh, school committee um, administration go to all multiple schools um, to look at. Uh, Situate, I think, was one. What were some of the other? Wakefield, Natick, Braintree. Um, so multiple to look at their designs. And it was actually what was nice is it's not only looking at what they have, but the question that we always ask is, what would you have done different? And that to us was, was important because in terms of the design, what didn't work for them? 
Um, so, okay. we so would, but basically, you're kind of making new ground here with the school design and incorporating all these plans. There's like a, you, we can't go to an existing town and see this exact building built someplace else. And it's not exact. For example, if if another school doesn't have a robotics program, you know that that wouldn't be. I think um, Natick built a planetarium because they had a program that was designed around a planetarium. Uh -huh. So different STEAM labs maybe would, would look different depending on what the school currently has or is looking to, to okay. continue or expand. Then with the different floors, is that like grade six is on one floor, seven's on another, eight, or mm -hmm. are they moving back and forth? The, the grade levels are separate because we want to create those neighborhoods, those small neighborhoods. Um, the related arts offering, obviously there's one gym. So they're going to have to, it, it's, it's interwoven into the fabric of the larger school. Uh -huh. But in terms of those grade levels, they're, they're going to be separate. Okay. Then um, the last question that? I have is on the solar. Oh, I was going to add to the layout okay. real quickly. So one of the things that it, it also affects the model school as well is the biggest driving factor with the model school is you never have the model site. So where districts decide to locate their buildings for a variety of reasons, a lot of times drives the shape of buildings, right? And also how uh, districts want to lay out their buildings. So uh, an important factor for this building was a kind of a, a public area and an academic area, whereas some districts decide that they'd rather have it more inter interwoven throughout the building for a variety of reasons. So if you go to a district and say, I really love the Natick Middle School, and then you come back to the Walpole site or you go to Braintree and say, I love this school, and you come back to the Walpole site, well, that doesn't fit. And now you need to start to manipulate that. So they started to see that although they used the model design, they ended up having to reconfigure pieces of that model. Mm -hmm. And any saving that you had from having an efficient design on the first building, you just basically spent in reconfiguring it and redoing all the site that wasn't on that original school. So, um, And then the way that the floors are laid out, currently they're one, one grade per floor. But with the stacking effect in the academic core, it does provide for the opportunity to do vertical orientation as well, um, okay. if you wanted to do that. Just a, a quick question on the solar arrays. Yeah. They talk about solar. Are you actually taking that solar energy and putting it into the school here, or are you really just taking that energy, giving it back to Eversource, you get your energy from Eversource and they give you a credit for what you give them? You can do it different ways. It really depends on how you structure the solution and how you structure the agreement. So. If you do like a power purchase agreement, which is the terminology for signing up with a vendor, that's basically what you do is you harvest it, you get a reduction on your bill, and then they basically take uh, the solar energy and put it back into the grid. If you end up keeping it on site and do something with battery storage where you're actually um, using that maybe as um, to offset a generator usage or to offset the peak hours of the demand, demand hours of the day, that's still to be determined. So there are options that are available. Um, it, should point out though that buildings of this size, I mean the solar array size that you would need to actually kind of run the building off the grid, so to speak, um, is pretty large. So one of the one of the aspects that we're looking into that a lot of schools are doing, Natick just did it. They just installed them um, are canopies over parking areas to try to maximize the amount of arrays they can have. So the infrastructure that we have on this project would be to have conduits out to the parking lots. So if that ever becomes a decision, you already have the infrastructure to get that back into an electric room. Mm -hmm. um, from a, from a, I'm kind of jumping here. From an approval process, does the town meeting have to approve this, and the vote, the town vote has to approve it, or if the town meeting said no, but we still went to the vote, would the vote override what the town meeting decided? Do you understand, Mark? So we'd have to have a another town meeting after the um, the election if it were to pass. So the town meeting says yes. The vote it, says yes. The the project's approved. The town meeting says no. The vote says yes. Then another town meeting would have to be called. Yes, because you'd have to appropriate the money. Okay. So we're appropriating it first asking for it and if it doesn't go any obviously there's not enough funds to there's no funds to be appropriated so it goes nowhere and if the town meeting and the vote both say no it's dead and the process basically starts all over again uh, the msva gives you a, a pretty short window 
um, to possibly come back, you know, and decide if you want to re-vote it. Um, so so just you, to chime in, Mark, I've already asked that question of town okay. council. Yeah. So living through this in the past, I thought of the library. Um, there is an opportunity, let's say, if there's a group that wants to push this forward after, if it gets voted down, you, we can bring it up. Like Brian said, it's a very short time frame. I can't recall if it was January 2nd or January 20th it needs to be done by, but early January, you'd have to reconvene everything and line up right. all back up. If you miss that window, then basically it's, it's done and you're starting all over. Yeah, year. and the way that it works with the MSBA is if you miss that window, you the project is closed and you have to resubmit a statement of interest. Um, so assuming that your statement of interest gets accepted, I mean, even if they were to fast track it because they've done, quote unquote, done the project before, I mean, we're, what are we, we're three years since the acceptance of yeah. the, and we still have a year to go before we start construction. So you're four years out before we'd actually start construction again, assuming right. an approved town meeting again. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank right. I think it was addressed before, but I forget. Um, I was looking at the schematic uh, plan for the fields. Did yeah. we lose those fields for the duration of the construction? Can we lose them? Yeah, are kids going to be able to play on those during the? No, part of the one of the criteria and one of the factors in kind of finalizing where the site was was maintaining those fields as much as possible. And right now, um, other than putting the road in, which is supposed to happen roughly. You know, rough grading and everything will be that summer. The goal is that those fields are entirely usable during construction. And up at the top, it looks like there's some new spaces. You've got some lines striped in there. Yeah, so I, there's some parallel parking along that driveway. And I think the reality was in schematic design, you're kind of seeing what fits and like what you can get in there. Um, and that's something that's up for consideration is that the potentially of having some off street parking for the fields and maybe eliminate you know, some of the parking issues along East Street. But currently, yeah, there are a few spaces along that road for parking at the field. Um, I feel like I'm looking at stripes in the grass, like soccer fields. Yeah, I think those are striped for the little kids' soccer. Okay. Um, now, those are outside of the building, so those would be ineligible costs. Is that correct? What? That Are, are those outside of the 115? They already exist. Those, those small fields in the upper corner, those already exist for the kids. Why? That's no, actually the photograph from an aerial photo that yeah. those lines yeah. exist in the fall, I think, for yeah. kids soccer. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's what was thrown down. All right. Yep. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, because I have a lot of history. Uh, let's continue on with the uh, school building article. Um, Jim, I did actually have a question for you on the school building. Um, the reimbursements that come from the state, do those automatically flow to free cash, or do they come and compensate the project? So you're asking about the reimbursements, yeah, Mark? The reimbursements. Do they automatically come to the town and become part of free cash, or do they get reserved and applied against? The They'll get reserved and applied because so what in the end what we have to do is using rough numbers, we have to pass the one hundred and fifteen million dollar override. But the numbers that you've been provided at four hundred and thirty eight thousand per average household valued in Walpole, um, that 438 is based upon the $77 million number. Okay. So just to give you an example, I asked today, Jody, how have we been doing with collecting money right now? It, out of the $1.5 million that uh, Brian referenced, we have been collecting money periodically every month or every other month. So eventually, that just goes back to offset the project costs. I'm, we're going to have four to 600000 at least left over from that original $1.5 million to probably reappropriate, so towards something down the road. So things that have been reimbursed for prior costs will 
Yeah, because that wasn't an override. That was just right. we certified it was free cash number, and then it rolled forward towards this project. Right, but on, on the purposes of the override, whatever the state reimburses us in that construction project will be applied to construction costs. Yeah. Because otherwise we're, we're borrowing. Yeah, you're borrowing, yeah, and then you have to way more than we need. Debt. Yeah. Other questions on the building project? There being none, I'll entertain a motion. Oh. Andrew? Motion for favorable action. Okay. I have a motion for favorable Second. action. Uh, Andrew? Second. Second by Susan. Motion for all present. Um, by a show of hands, all in favor? It's hard to, yeah. you abstain? Abstain or no? No. 13 1. Also on our agenda tonight is uh, applying free cash to the current year school budget. These are items that get collected. Um, during the prior fiscal year and closed the free cash, but they were generated as a result of school program and the school relies on that money to balance their current year budget. So we're just taking what was certified for free cash that they generated uh, and applying it to this year's budget for them. Uh, the amount is $293,895 that covers Medicare reimbursements and student parking fees that were collected in the spring for the school year, the coming school year. You said 895. Oh, sorry, 892, correct. Okay. Yep. 293, 893. Article 14. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Yep. Okay. Any questions or comments on Article 14? There being none, I'll entertain a motion. I move the approval of Article 14. Okay. The amount is 293,890. A second. And seconded by Josette. By a show of hands, all in favor? Okay. 1400. Jim, did you have any uh, announcements for us or updates? Yeah. So, the two article numbers you voted on, um, the Sewer and Water Commission asked to withdraw their Article 13, 13. so everything will get bumped. But just to clarify, Tonight you voted favorable action on the Medicare article and the school article. I'll just right. just so you don't have to re-vote it. We'll, we'll adjust okay. the minutes so it's yeah. reflected accordingly. Okay, thank you. All righty. Yeah. Oh, and uh, so for what is it Thursday night? Thursday. Uh, planning board can't make it, so it's just going to be um, the water articles and the uh, citizen form, petition. The, the citizen petition to East Walpole. Okay. Okay. Owner. And we're back at our regular meeting room. Yes. Uh, hybrid. Which, which article? Uh, oh, yeah. Which, was it Article 13 that was being removed? Yeah, Article 13, which okay. is the sewer uh, borrowing. Okay. For a million right. So we'll be reconvening on Thursday back at our mo normal meeting room. Um, I want to put in a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved by Susan. Second by Josette. All in favor of adjourning? We stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.